So hello viewers and welcome to Mark on Motoring. Today we're driving something a little bit different, a little bit special. In the UK we uh, do seem to like our convertibles which is pretty strange really because, uh, well let's face it, it rains quite a lot here. But um, back in the late 90s Mercedes had a bit of an epiphany. What if we could have the benefit of a nice open top two seat roadster but with the practicality of a hard roof? Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the Mercedes SLK. Today I feel incredibly privileged because Jonathan has loaned me this fantastic Mercedes R170 SLK. Uh, now this particular car is a facelift which came from 2000 onwards but the car ran from 1996 up until 2004. Um, this particular version is the uh, SLK 200 so that's a 2 litre and it's a compressor so it's a supercharged version. Now, what marks this out as being a facelift car? Well, starting around the front, we've got revised bumpers um, over the original cars. Now, this particular one has got AMG front bumpers on, so there's an extra little trim piece down there, but uh, it's very... Um, so, you, you, the untrained eye, you would probably struggle to tell the difference. The um, grille as well, this car actually has an AMG uh, front grille, and it is actually a little bit reminiscent of what came later with the uh, R171 front end design. We've got upgraded alloys on this car as well. These facelift cars have the colour-coded side skirts. Pre-facelift cars um, basically had black sills on them. We've also got the um, side repeaters here integrated into these door mirrors. Now, this is something manufacturers all seem to do these days, but back in the late 1990s uh, and early 2000s, this was quite a, quite a thing, quite a, a big deal. And it's a similar story around the back as well. We've got revised bumpers, with stainless steel exhaust trim, uh, and slightly revised rear tail lights as well. Now my Yorkshire accent probably doesn't do many favours for the English language, so no doubt I would definitely butcher the German. But SLK translates roughly to sports light um, Kurtz, I believe it is, which is short. So what we've got is a lightweight sports car um, that is short. Now as it happens, the wheelbase on this car of 2.4 metres is identical to that of the um, 190 SL from back in the 1950s. So we're inside the Sportlight Compact. Um, so yeah, like a lot of um, front engine rear drive sports cars, you do have to sort of bring your knee up a bit to get your foot in because the, the front of the door doesn't go all the way to the uh, front of the footwell um, like it would in a traditional family car for example but once in it's quite comfortable in here so we've got these uh, leather sport seats in here which are really nice um, just about wide enough to be comfortable but narrow enough to um, give you all the support you need steering wheel yeah it's um, it, it's certainly not a tiny steering wheel but it's not huge either uh, leather wrapped in this car now these um, were actually revised as well on the facelift cars so very slight subtle changes there front of me here is three gauges um, with this white backing which looks really really nice. White gauges were quite a thing in the late 90s and early 2000s, it made a, a bit of a renaissance. Um, so to my right I've got a rev counter which reads around to 7000 with a red line starting at six and a quarter. We've got a 160 mile per hour speedo in the centre with a few basic warning lights and a trip meter down there. And to the left we've got our temperature and fuel gauges um, with another LCD display at the bottom there as well. So this car is fitted with a black interior. Now, on the la at launch there were a few other colours. I'm told there was a yellow and a blue interior, though I've not seen those myself. The ones I have seen though that look quite nice, all this lower section here, all this centre console and part of the door cards is red and they actually do look quite good. 
uh, do look really nice. So moving across to the centre up here we've got this little drawer that pops out which as it happens is a round mobile phone size so let's see if my little phone here which is in a case or oh, not quite so that's a Google Pixel 3 by the way but I have got a case on it so without the case that would probably fit inside there quite well close that one up uh, now there was a cup holder option there as well now as someone who owns a 90s car myself um, occasionally we do miss cup holders how did we ever live without cup holders back in the day so moving down we've got the uh, two cent events here below that we've got these um, separate temperature controls for the driver and passenger dimmest button recirculator and air conditioning now who'd have thought that back in the day a lot of Mercedes like this didn't have air conditioning maybe they thought being a convertible we wouldn't use it so this car has that which is a very nice addition so below that we've got our factory fit Mercedes um, CD radio I believe you could actually get a CD changer as well for these I think they might have mounted in the centre armrest, but I could be wrong there. So below that we've got some more switch gear, then we've got our pop-out ashtray, because cars in the 90s always had ashtrays, and a little coin holder as well. So when you're uh, going along the toll road, you've got your coins all set there while you parking change. Marvellous. Little storage cubby down here, electric window switches either side of the um, gear shifter, and an airbag off switch. Now, down to the business end. The majority of these cars I expect will have sold with the automatic. There was a manual, but uh, well, I'm told they weren't particularly good. We've got a switch with W and S. Now, it's up for debate as to what these actually stand for. Um, S, I'm told, could stand for standard, or at least some early Mercedes pro promo footage suggests that's the case. I'm also told it could mean sport or summer. And W, um, well, jury seems a little bit uh, more convinced on that, that that is for winter. So S is the uh, normal mode that we would use. So behind there, we've got our electric window switches. And behind that, the exciting red button, because red buttons are always more exciting. And that one is for our folding roof. So holding that all the way back, um, we'll drop our roof. And if we keep it held in place, when the roof drops, the windows will then come back up as well. A little storage cubby and a cigar lighter that appears to be in there very nice handbrake and center armrest we've also got some little like map pockets behind here similar to the ones we've got in the uh, these expanding door pockets as well very nice now one thing i do want to mention i did touch on mercedes quality a little bit earlier on um, Mercedes went through a bit of a rough patch in the late 90s and early 2000s and the quality of a lot of their vehicles, well shall we say, it was less impressive. In fact, a friend of mine had it as a company car and the glove box, the lower half of the dash, fell off. Yep, that's right. Just fell clean off and landed in the footwell. Very un-Mercedes. I am pleased to report, however, that Jonathan's car is nothing like that one. In fact, these cars are known for the colour wearing on these. In fact, I saw one where all this centre console was worn away, the dashboard round where the ignition key was was all scuffed and all the door cards, all the colour had worn away. Now, Jonathan has actually bought um, from Mercedes the correct colour of rubberised paint to uh, restore all this dashboard. And this interior does look fantastic, really, really nice. Glove box as well is uh, sort of has this gas strut so it drops down really nice and slow. I know it's the little things but that's that's quite a nice little touch. That's also flock lined as well. Very strokeable, very nice. So yeah, that, that's quite a nice touch. There is a bit of a creak if you press on that with the, the plastic but cost cutting at this period. Um, we've also got a passenger airbag and we've got, uh, we appear to have side airbags as well in this car which um, Again, for that era, it was quite a big deal. It was only just sort of starting to come in on cars, um, but Mercedes were always quite big on safety, so nice to see those in here. Uh, being a convertible, we've not got very much up top, but we do have um, our light here and uh, switch gear for that, and obviously his and hers sun visors. Behind me here, we have these um, hoop tops, um, rollover hoops, which uh, hopefully you'd never need, but it's reassuring to know that they're there uh, in the event that you do. The SLK can swallow up a couple of weekend bags, even with this dividing place which has to be there in order for the roof to operate. So the roof in the SLK should take around 25 seconds 
to go down. But windows first, trunk lid comes up, there's the roof folding, trunk lid coming down, and I'm keeping hold of this button here and I'm told the windows should. Ah yeah, the windows come back up. Fantastic. But even the door furniture on this car is quite nice with the chrome door handle. We've got some more of this nice turned metal trim in there as well. And we've even got these lovely chrome caps on the end of the doors, which I quite like. Um, earlier cars, I believe, have those in black but it does add an air of quality to the vehicle and was very reminiscent of Mercedes sort of from the 1960s. buzz around this car when it was released back in 1996 um, because of its roof. So what we have here is a folding hardtop which Mercedes uh, patented Vario fold. Now um, folding hardtops weren't something new that we'd never seen before. In fact it was seen on larger cars um, a few decades earlier but we weren't used to seeing them on cars of this size and they became incredibly popular with cars like the Peugeot 206 um, adopting a similar style roof shortly after um, and many other cars over the last few decades now. So this car was launched with some four cylinder engines. There was a normally aspirated two litre which didn't make it to the UK. I'm presuming Mercedes didn't think that was worthy of their uh, new sports car in our market. But what we did get though was this two litre four cylinder supercharged engine. We also got the uh, 230 which as you may guess was 2.3 litre supercharged engine and then later on that was joined by a 3.2 litre V6. Um, there was also an AMG version of the uh, V6 which was stupidly powerful and uh, to be honest probably far more than you really need to enjoy a car like this. Now we did already have quite a long standing love affair by this time with cars like the Mazda MX-5 which uh, was on sale from 1989. Now that car was more of a uh, lightweight roadster and was heavily inspired by the old British sports cars like the MGB and Lotus Elan. Mercedes though I think was aiming at a slightly higher market with this and uh, when this car, this particular car was new it was around £30,000, which um, back in the late 1990s, even in 2000, was still quite a lot of money. Of course, it wasn't the only car in the uh, £30,000-ish sector. So we had cars like the Sublime Porsche Boxster, uh, that, obvious, that car having a mid-mounted flat six engine. Perhaps this car's chief rival though would have been from their old adversary BMW with their Z3. Of course the Z3 didn't have the folding roo uh, metal roof of this car, rather a traditional soft top, um, which is obviously something that other manufacturers have uh, clambered to try and recreate ever since. But what you really want to know about this car is how does it drive? Well, so far I've just been uh, pootling along through this village and it is quite pleasant. Yes, it's a low slung sports car, but it does ride very, very nicely indeed. We might only have a four cylinder engine under here, but um, the exhaust note is quite nice on this car. It does sound, uh, well, quite creamy, almost V6 like. 
Um, now, so this is a two litre with 160 horsepower. We've got the supercharger, so that does give us. Um, oh, yeah, and there's 60 mile an hour. So, yeah, 160 horsepower from this two litre supercharged engine. Made it to a five speed automatic gearbox. There were five and six speed manuals, but apparently they're not very good, so perhaps best avoided. By all accounts, they just feel a bit clunky. Um, but yeah, we've got the automatic in here, five speed, and uh, the car kicked down there and we're straight from 30 to 60 miles per hour. Now, approaching a bend here, and uh, how does the car feel through here? Well, yeah, quite composed. Obviously, not exactly going like a bat out of hell through there, but uh, yeah, the car felt quite composed. Uh, I'm not I've not experienced any scuttle shake in this car either. Steering is actually a recirculating ball, which uh, Mercedes used for quite a while. Now, it's not uncommon on um, luxury cars, but on sports cars, yeah, you don't really get that sort of steering setup. That said though, Mercedes, it's obviously tried and tested for them, and it does seem to work quite well in here. Um, I wouldn't say it's got a huge amount of feel, but it does weigh up quite nice. And it certainly uh, doesn't feel in any way disconcerting, um, pressing on through those bends there. So yeah, I'd be quite happy with that. Now one thing where the SLK um, probably isn't true to its name is light because it's certainly not the lightest car in its class but that's probably partially thanks to that folding roof but it certainly feels uh, agile enough so it's approaching another bend here obviously I am being very mindful that this is not actually my car yeah it feels quite good um, with the supercharged engine, we've got peak torque sort of between two and a half and four and a half thousand revs, so um, it, it certainly does feel like it's got plenty of power there. there a few times there I did feel that it did want to perhaps kick down, so maybe the larger engines um, might be a little less inclined to want to do that, but it, no, I, it certainly uh, seems quite willing and able. There is a manual override as well, but um, Manual overrides on automatic gearboxes usually aren't all that good. Let's go around the roundabout and back down the other side, so let's see how it uh, handles that. Now the windscreen is quite small here, but uh, that is quite typical of any sports car in this letterbox. But visibility generally I wouldn't say is that bad, obviously. Certainly with the roof off, um, the fad car doesn't feel claustrophobic. So, I think this car really is suited to um, being a bit more of a cruiser. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's perfectly capable down a B road as it has just uh, demonstrated. But uh, yeah, cruising along here, sort of 55 mile an hour, dual carriageway, very pleasant indeed. I could quite see myself uh, maybe taking one of these on a little extended road trip. Now Jonathan has kindly installed the wind deflector at back here for me. Now um, he did mention, he says it does restrict rear visibility a little bit, which it does, but I wouldn't say it's uh, the be all and end all. And I thought it a worthy sacrifice, certainly while filming, just to try and cut down a little bit of the uh, noise and buffeting. But even on a dual carriageway, I wouldn't say it was noisy in here, even though the top of this windscreen is quite low, sort of level with the top of my head. Um, it certainly wasn't a problem that I uh, could see. So I'm now going back down this stretch of B road that I came along and uh, yeah, I could stick my foot down and uh, launch it at the sky, but to be honest, I don't really want to. It's not that kind of car. If you want something to um, really press on with a little bit and uh, for those B-road blasts, I don't know, maybe you would stick with an MX-5 and save yourself a few quid. Or maybe, if your budget permits it, you would go for something like the Porsche Boxster. I haven't uh, had the pleasure of the uh, BMW Z3. Maybe you've got one of those that you'd like me to uh, review. So I can't really draw a comparison on that car. Um, but I imagine there perhaps a little bit more uh, 
driver focused sports cars. But to sum up, well, dislikes, not really a lot. Um, I, I quite like this car, but then uh, I suppose I am getting to an age where I do enjoy a little bit of comfort these days. Things that I like, well, quite a lot on this. I mean, as I said, this is an exceptionally good example. Uh, Jonathan has done a lot of work. This car was, um, well, one step away from going for scrap. And uh, luckily, Jonathan stepped in at just the right time and uh, saved it. And he's obviously sunk a lot of time and effort into this car. And it really does show it is a, an exquisite example. Um, but what I really like about this car, I think what, what this car really is, in summary, is a cut-down SL. Now, a big SL that back in the day was probably 70,000 plus, um, with its big V8 or V12 engine, uh, would have been all good and well. It, it probably uh, worked quite well in America. But on our antiquated road systems here in the UK, well, maybe it was just a bit of a big car and an expensive one at that. Also, fuel prices have always been notoriously higher here in the UK than they have stateside. Um, certainly not more so than now, where I think I put some V-Power in the other day, and it was about 184 a litre for V-Power, so uh, yeah, not good at all. But this car, yeah, certainly much more affordable to run. Um, a lot better suited to our roads in terms of its size. And uh, like I say, if you really did want to, you could have the V6, but um, then you've got the increased running, running and servicing costs, and you've also got uh, a, the higher road tax uh, banding as well. So, um, yeah, the 200 or the 230 could well probably be the car. I reckon the 230 is probably going to be the, tweet, the sweet spot, but like I say, with 160 horsepower, this car is certainly no slouch. When you really want it to, want to it can, you can pick its heels up quite well, but um, like I say, I just don't think it's that kind of car. It's, it's a car that is best enjoyed at half speed, shall we say. Now, I'm rolling back into a village here, and uh, I think this car really does actually quite suit the village. It, um, it Especially in this silver as well, it's got that very sort of um, middle class appearance. It's understated enough that you don't really notice it, um, but when you do notice it, it just oozes elegance, which is what a Mercedes should do. Um, I do have a bit of a bugbear, I think a lot of new Mercedes, well, not just Mercedes, a lot of these prestige brands, uh, especially some of the sportier versions, they just look far too aggressive these days and too shouty, and that's not what a prestige German car should be, in my opinion. Another thing, Due to its size and, like I said, this automatic transmission, this car is incredibly easy to drive, um, which I can see why these were so popular. I've really, really enjoyed this car today, and uh, it will be quite sad to give it back to Jonathan. Now, I do have to say a big thank you to Jonathan, who has uh, loaned me this car. I know he spent a lot of time actually cleaning this car because he wanted it to be perfect for me uh, to review today as well. And he was, he's been quite happy to uh, get involved and help out with aspects of the filming as well, which has uh, really made all the difference. Now, sadly, it's almost time for me to hand this car back, but I've thoroughly enjoyed this today. Um, there will hopefully be some more road test reviews coming up soon as well as more event coverage so make sure you hit that uh, subscribe button and the bell notification and um, to make sure that you're notified when the next video goes live so thank you very much for watching and until next time it is goodbye from me